Good afternoon, here we are yet again with another lovely lesson of CENG 3325 Structural Analysis. This is going to be the 10th lecture, part 2 uh, in the video series, and what I want to do today is I want to look uh, through a really long form example of shear and moment diagrams via integration. So we discussed this previously uh, in the first part of lesson 10, and what I would like to do here is work through a more long form example um, showing how you transition from one zone of integration to another as you work your way across a beam. So let us look at uh, shear and moment diagrams via uh, integration. Via integration, and let's call this a long example. All right, so here's what's going to be given. Here is the system we're going to be working with today. I'll have the following beam, and it's going to be a simply supported beam with a rather interesting uh, load arrangement. I don't know why or how you'd have a beam like this, but uh, you can have quite uh, complex loads on beams, so let's say we do. So let's say we have something like this. Uh, this is going to be end A, and end B, and uh, let's show the loads as follows. So I'm going to have first a triangular load on the first six feet of the beam. Maybe I'll make that a little bit longer. Something like that. We'll have this, and this will be three kips per foot. And then let's say there's a uh, constant load of two kips per foot in the next four feet. And then four feet further, I'm going to have a 20 kip point load. And then let's just say for fun, at the end there is a 24 uh, kip foot uh, couple or point moment, however you refer to, however you prefer to call these. Okay, then in terms of reactions, uh, I'm going to ignore the AX. Yes, it's a pin joint, so there could be an AX on there, but I have no horizontal loads on this, so we can recognize that that would be zero. I'm just going to say that there has to be an AX, or sorry, an AY and a BY. So a vertical reaction at A and a vertical reaction at B. AY and BY. So this is given, and also I'll go ahead and label the dimensions on here so we have a consistent, uh, nice and consistent uh, start here. And again, let's get all our dim lines on here. Let's say this is six feet, four feet, four feet, and four feet. So all this is given, and then uh, we'll want to find uh, let's find here uh, let's say we want to find the shear and moment functions all the way along uh, beam AB. And if you look at this, you can realize that this is going to be fairly complex. We have, um, looking at this, well, let, let's count the number of discontinuities. I have one discontinuity here at the start of the beam, one discontinuity here where one uh, load function ends, another begins, one here where this, dis where this load function ends, uh, one here at the point load, and one here at the end and also where the reaction and the couple are applied. So I have one two, three, four, five discontinuities, which means I'm going to have one, two, three, four zones of integration. So we can see that I'm going to have zones of integration first in the first six feet, then the next four feet, then the next four feet, and then the final four feet. So you can see this is going to be fairly complex. This is going to be a piecewise function, or our final result is going to be some sort of piecewise function with uh, four different bounds on it. So this is going to be quite complex, and you might want to get a snack. 
we're gonna be here a while okay anyway so let's work through this now uh, our first step so let's just go ahead and find the solution all right write, write down solution here for completion's sake we're just gonna do a nice good old-fashioned statics problem but uh, this is a bit more advanced than I usually teach in statics, so we can call this a structural analysis problem. The kids in statics don't get to uh, you don't get to have uh, beams so uh, well. The, the kids in well, the students in structural analysis won't have uh, beams as simple as the kids in statics do. But uh, anyway, so uh, we have this, and our first step. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, you know what? Let's do this right. I'm going to go ahead and label everything in. in different colors and headings and everything else. So let's go and do a series of steps. And step one. Step one is going to be just to find the reactions. Very simple. Let's find the reactions. So the first step is going to be to find the reactions. And to do this, I'm just going to do a balance of moments. And I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a lot of care here to make sure I get these right. And because I really want to make sure I don't screw up the reactions, because if I do, everything else is going to be wrong from here on out. So, and in a problem this long, uh, we want to take great care to check our work as we go. So we'll do that in a couple stages. But uh, you'll see one of the checks I'll use in a bit here. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a sum of moments about A here, a sum of moments about point A. And this is going to be equal to negative one half times uh, three kips per foot. Uh, let's see, times six feet, times two feet. Okay, and then, um, so what is this? What is this one half, uh, three kips per foot times six foot times two feet? Well, if you look at this here, the one half times three times six, this is the equivalent point load of the triangular load on the left side of the beam. And then, we, the, then it's going to produce a moment uh, equivalent to a point load at its centroid, and the centroid of a triangle is, of course, one third uh, from one third the distance from its largest leg or from its uh, leg. So, the centroid is basically right here. One third of six feet is two feet, and so the total distance is going to be two feet. So, this is the equivalent load here, and this is the moment arm here. So, the total load is, well, I guess that would be nine kips. Uh, one half times uh, six is three times three is nine and then uh, times a moment arm from A of two feet. And it's negative because it's rotating clockwise about point A. Then um, minus two kips per foot, we need to get the, now we need to get the uh, equivalent point load of the uh, constant load. So minus two kips per foot times a length of four feet. And the centroid of this thing is gonna be halfway down or six plus two is eight feet. So we know we have a moment arm of eight feet. And of course negative because this is also rotating clockwise about point A. Then minus 20 kips uh, times a moment arm of 14 feet. That's just six plus four plus 10 is 14 feet. Then I'm gonna add the 24 kip feet. And of course, we're not gonna have a moment arm on that because it's already a, a couple, it already has moment arm. Uh, you don't need to add any kind of moment arm if it's already a couple. So I know this is a bit of a statics review. Um, plus 18 feet times by. That will be the moment, the clockwise, or the counterclockwise and this positive moment produced by the reaction at B equals zero. And if you multiply all that out and solve for by, you will get that by is equal to 18.777, uh, basically seven repeating, or I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and write this as 18.778 kips. So we have our first reaction, 18.778 kips. Now I could go and do a sum of uh, forces in the vertical direction here, and that would actually be quicker than what I'm actually gonna do. But remember what I said. I want to make sure I really don't screw this up. So what I'm going to do instead is, instead of using a sum of forces to get the reaction at A, I'm going to do a sum of moments at B. And that's going to be an independent calculation because I'm not going to need to use that BY because it doesn't have a moment arm uh, about point B. And so 
um, I'll have two independent calculations, and then I can just do a sum of forces in the vertical direction to check my answers. Again, I want to make really sure that I don't screw up my, um, my uh, reactions, because if we get this wrong, everything else is screwed up. So let's make sure we get this right the first time. And then so the sum of moments about B here, uh, it's just going to be the reverse of this thing, of, of, of the previous one, effectively. So negative AY times 18 feet. That is the moment caused by the reaction at A. And it's negative because it's a, would, it, would be, it would produce a clockwise rotation about point B. Here's AY, clockwise rotation about point B. That's why I attacked a negative on there. Then um, I want to get the uh, moment caused by the triangular load. So plus 1 half times... Uh, 3 kips per foot, uh, same equivalent point load, times uh, 6 feet. Again, we'll get a equivalent point load of that triangular load of a total of 9 kips. But now the moment arm is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be 16 feet this time. It's going to be 16 feet because, again, the centroid of this triangular load is right here, 2 feet from the left, or a total of 16 feet from point B. And notice, all of these loads here, this one, this one, and this one, are going to have positive moments because all of them rotate clockwise, or sorry, counterclockwise, about point B. Then uh, keep, let's just keep working through this, plus uh, 2 kids per foot times 4 feet times 10 feet. That's the moment caused by the constant uh, value uh, distributed load. And again, the moment arm length is going to be 4 plus 4 plus half of its uh, length. So 4 plus 4 plus 2 is 10 feet. Uh, and then I want to get the point. I, got, I have to include the moment caused by the point load. So plus 20 kips times 4 feet. And then plus the moment caused by the couple, 24 kip feet. And of course, we know that it won't have a moment arm because it's already a couple. This equals 0. And if you combine all that together and do a little, a little tiny bit of algebra, you will get that AY is equal to 18.222 kips. So 18.2 repeating kips. Now I could, this, I could leave this as a fraction, but uh, I'll leave it as a decimal because I'm lazy, so that'll work. Okay, so now I mentioned that I want to check this, so I'm going to go ahead and check these. I'm going to try to do a few checks along the way just to make sure I have, oh, everything I should. Make sure I don't screw up. These are, whenever you have a very long, uh, whenever you have a very long problem like this, I mean, if you have to work through something complex, um, it's always good to do uh, checks of this manner. So let's go ahead and check it. And a good check for this, would, like I mentioned previously, is a sum of forces in the vertical re uh, direction. So the vertical, um, I'll have, basically I'm just going to add up the equivalent point loads of everything and the two reactions, and that's it. So I'm going to have, uh, let's see, negative uh, one half for the triangular load. That's going to basically be just one half base times height, like we've had previously. Uh, negative three kips per foot times one half times six feet minus two kips per foot times four feet. And then, okay, again, this is the uh, load of the, uh, the triangular load, equivalent point load of the triangular load. This is the equivalent point load of the distributed load, as we've talked uh, previously. Then minus the 20 kip point load. And then plus our two reactions, AY and BY. So plus 18.78 plus 18.22. And if you go and add all those, throw those into a calculator, add them all up, you will find that indeed these equal zero. So our reactions are valid. We can keep moving forward, confident, uh, knowing that we got the correct reactions. If we didn't get the right, if this, if this didn't add up to zero, we would know that by our reactions, um, we would know that this thing is not in equilibrium. We know that we did something wrong. So if this beam is going to be, if, if uh, this beam is in equilibrium, the sum of forces in all directions must equal zero, and the sum of moments about any point are going to equal, must equal zero. Um, and so we can use that as a useful check. Alternately, if you didn't want to do that, you could also, if you wanted to for some reason, 
Uh, I don't even just for any reason. I suppose you just could. You could get a y via summing forces in the vertical direction, and then you could use a sum of moments about b, or really any point. You could use any equation. Uh, again, if something's going to be in equilibrium, it's going to be in equilibrium at any point. So you could just go and sum moments about uh, here if you wanted, or here, or 20 feet to the right if you wanted. But that would be a little bit more inconvenient than just doing a sum of forces in the vertical as a check. But anyway. Regardless of how you do it, if you are working through a long-form example uh, or a lo long-form problem uh, with many different steps and things like that, I do highly encourage uh, sprinkling in steps in there to uh, check your work as you go. Okay, so my next step is going to be to develop my uh, load functions. So I need to have something that I can integrate, and in order to do that, I need to get my load functions in the first place. In the previous uh, lesson, or part one of this lesson, we learned that, uh, or and we saw that shear is the, the in equal to the negative integral of uh, the load function, and we know that moment is equal to the integral of uh, shear, or at least the change in each. Is. And we've learned also that the, it's not exactly equal to; it's more equal to the change, but uh, uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, et cetera, et cetera. So, but in order to integrate, we actually have to have something to integrate. So let's get those functions. So step two, develop load functions. So uh, let me go back and look at this really briefly. Or let me go back to our drawing here. So load functions. I, load functions, it's important to keep in mind. Let me put a little note here. Load functions define or describe Distributed load only. This is a good review. Distributed load only. Uh, point loads can cause discontinuities in load functions, but load function, in order to be something that smoothly transitions along the length of the beam, as it's, in other words, uh, a load as a function of x, we need to have some sort of um, load that is applied over a length. And so looking at this here, I'm going to have a load, um, I'm going to have one load function from 0 to 6 feet, um, one load function from 0 to 6 feet, that's fairly obvious, and then I'm going to have another one from 4 to 10, but interestingly enough, my load function is actually going to equal 0 in this region here and this region here, because remember, load functions describe only distributed loads. Now, it doesn't mean these uh, this, this point load and this couple will not have an effect. They absolutely will, um, at least on the shear and the moment. But uh, in terms of the load functions, the only things that will cause anything or any effect are this and this. Because again, load functions describe only distributed loads. So let's get this. Uh, as we mentioned, there are four load regions. Uh, four uh, load regions are needed. Now I'm gonna go ahead and split this into four regions. Even though I know the third and the fourth region are gonna have the same load function, I, I am gonna need separate functions later on, so I'm just gonna call them, uh, get in the habit of putting them all as, as four separate regions, just for consistency's sake. So four load regions are needed due to discontinuities. Uh, are needed due, due to load discontinuities. Uh, load discontinuities. And so uh, w of x will be a piecewise function as follows. If you're having trouble visualizing this, it's going to be a piecewise function as follows. And all of my uh, shear and moment functions will also uh, have this kind of format. So we don't have this yet, but we can get it. w of x is going to look something like this. It's going to be one big function, but there'll be four sub-expressions. So I'm going to have w1 of x, I'm going to have some expression w1 of x, and this is going to be from x is 0 to x equals 6. And notice, I, I tend to use uh, less than or greater than on here. You'll very rarely ever see me put a less than or equal to because by definition, these boundaries are defined by discontinuities. And uh, usually I think of them as uh, things where 
at the points of uh, where the where the bounds break down or where the, where the zones break down, the zones of integration break down, uh, there you have discontinuity. So there the functions usually aren't really defined there. So there may be some cases where you can get away using an equal sign, a less than equal to sign, or a greater than equal to sign, greater than or equal to sign. But usually I just put, I stick with the less than and greater than, or greater than, less than, depending on your perspective. So I'm going to have four functions, a w1 of x, or sorry, four, uh, four sub-expressions, w1 of x, w2 of x, w3 of x, and w4 of x, and each of these will be defined over a single zone. And these are the zones that we discussed previously, the source at the divided by where uh, all the discontinuities are. And as note, uh, remember we talked previously about how we need to use a consistent um, x origin. And we discussed this several times before, but uh, notice what I'm doing. I am not redefining my x every time I have a new zone. It's very tempting to always say, uh, to when you cut here, for example, to oh, when we start working here, it's very tempting to say, oh, let's put a new x right here and say this is x equals 0. And when you start working here, we'll say this is x equals 0, et cetera, et cetera. You can do that, but it, it's not going to produce a very good result. You're going to end up with something with a, you're going to confuse yourself. You're going to end up with something with inconsistent uh, shear and moment. Uh, you really do need to keep the x origin constant. So we need to find these four things, these four w functions. Now for the load, this isn't going to be that bad, uh, but for the shear and moment, uh, will be, they will be different. So the first one, w1 of x, let's get that. Let's get w1 of x. Now, I can look at this and say, in this function here, this expression here, this is definitely going to be a linear function, and it's fairly easy to get, because I can see that the slope, if you divide rise over run, you'll find that the slope is equal to negative one-half uh, kips per foot squared. Uh, kips per foot squared, and the slope, or the, and the uh, y-intercept is equal to b equals three kips per foot, so that means that my w1 as a function of x will be equal to negative 1 half x plus 3. Fairly straightforward. Then w2 as a function of x here. w2 as a function of x uh, is simply going to be 2. It doesn't change w2 to load from here to here. It's simply going to be equal to 2. Then w3 of x, I don't see any distributed load um, in my 10 to 14 feet, so this is just going to be equal to 0. Then w4 will be the same thing. w4 as a function of x is also equal to 0. So no change there. So we can then state our final uh, w of x. I'm going to, I like to, I'm going to keep uh, coming back to and summarizing these as I go. I do like reporting these as in a nice piecewise format, so I'm going to do that here as we go. So uh, here, let me go ahead and write out my our final uh, load functions. Again, it's important to keep in mind that these are only describing the distributed loads, not any point loads or reactions. So w of x is going to be equal to uh, negative one half x plus three when x is between zero and six. Then it's going to be equal to two when x is between six and ten. And if I wanted, I could put a little uh, kips per foot here to indicate the units because I'm leaving units off my math here. Then it will be equal to zero when x. Oh, forgot my less than. It'll be equal to zero when x is between. 10 and 14 uh, here, and then it'll be equal to 0 when x is between 14 and 18. And this is my final uh, full piecewise w of x function. And now I actually finally have something that I can integrate. And of course, remember, these are for distributed loads only. I'm going to keep stressing that until I sound like a broken clock, probably do already or a broken clock, no, broken record, got my analogies mixed up, uh, for distributed loads only. 
for distributed loads only. Point loads are excluded. Okay, now our next step is going to be to develop our load functions, or sorry, not load functions, develop our uh, shear functions. We have our load functions. Now we need to get our shear functions. This is going to be sheer excitement. Uh, oh boy. Let's get it sheer. Wow. Okay, so uh, anyway, let's keep working through this. Uh, incredibly stupid jokes aside. Uh, step three, let's develop the shear functions. And I'm going to just call these uh, v1 of x, v2 of x, v3 of x, etc. And all of these are going to be based off the following formula. It's a formula we saw last time, and that's that v of x is equal to the negative integral of w of x dx negative integral of w of x dx. So let's go and work through this. Now, uh, so let's see, I'm just going to have my v1 be just like I had uh, back here, w1, w2, w3. I'm going to have a v1, v2, v3, and v4. So let's get v1 of x first. That would be the first shear function, or the first, the first part of the shear function in our first zone from 0 to 6 feet. So v1 of x, if I can keep from jumping forward, uh, v1 of x is going to be equal to uh, the negative integral of w1 of x dx or equal to the negative integral of negative 1 half x plus 3 dx. All I've done is substitute in the uh, w1 of x expression. Then if you run through that integral, you'll find that v1 of x is going to be equal to, if just this is a simple polynomial integral, it's going to be 1 quarter x squared uh, minus 3x uh, plus c1. Now, uh, as we discussed previously, we have to worry about boundary conditions. Uh, we need to get our constant here. Or we, need to get, we need to find that constant that was produced by the integration, and we do that by a boundary condition. And really, this is the main reason I wanted to put together this long-form example, to see how the boundary conditions of integration from one zone to another interact with each other. So for this first zone, it's going to be very similar to the previous uh, example I worked through, a simpler example. But I need a boundary condition, and uh, I know that v1 of x equals 0 is going to be equal to 18.222 kips. How do I know that? Well, I know in general form, like if I have a beam, if I have you know, even just something like a, a distributed load across it, if you just put a, a uniform distributed load across a beam, its shear diagram ends up looking something like that. The uh, reaction on the left causes the shear to immediately jump up. The load causes it to decrease as it goes along, and then the uh, reaction on the right brings the final curve back up to zero. So uh, I know on the left end of the beam, since we have an upward reaction of 18.22 kips, that the shear at x equals zero has to be 18.22 kips. So uh, if I then substitute 18.222 into here, um, I can say here that uh, clearly that C1 is going to be equal to just 18.222. All when I put in 0 for this and 18.22 here, I, uh, the two x terms cancel out, leaving only 18.22. So therefore, V1 as a function of x is equal to a final uh, function or a final expression of 1 quarter x squared minus 3x plus 18.222. So I have my v1 of x. One down, three to go. Uh, next, v2 as a function of x. Well, let's see here. This is also equal to the integral of its load function. This time, w2 of x dx. And this one's going to be a little bit simpler integral, not that this one was terribly complicated. Uh, and that's just going to be the integral of 2 dx. Because the load in, in, the, in region 2 is just 2 kips per foot. And so that will come to, uh, simply, uh, that comes to negative 2x 
plus C2. Negative 2x plus C2. Now, suddenly I need a boundary condition. And the tricky thing about this is that looking at this beam, in this zones too, the from 6 to 10 feet, I don't have any reactions here. I don't have any beam ends. So I don't immediately have a value that I can just look at and say, oh, that's going to be zero for like an end moment or something, or oh, at a, at a pin joint or something, or oh, I know the you know reaction uh, or the shear here is positive 18 and uh, so and so. I can't do that. I don't have anything that's immediately obvious. Instead, I need to calculate my boundary condition. See. I know one thing, well I know many things, but one thing I do know in, in this case is that as long as you don't have any point loads, shear should be continuous. Uh, the shear function from here to here would, you know, from this interval here to here is not going to be differentiable because there's going to be a change in it, but it should be continuous. The only way you'll get discontinuities in the shear function is if you have a point load like this. So here, this will actually produce a discontinuity in the shear function, but this here, this will only change a discontinuity in the slope, which makes it a non-differentiable function, but it's still continuous across here. So remember all that fun uh, stuff from calculus of fun whether functions are discontinuity or, or continuous, but not differentiable, and you thought you'd never see that again. Nope, here it is. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, the point being that if, that if something is continuous, we know that the y values of that curve smoothly vary along there. The slope might suddenly change and the function might suddenly change, but you can have functions that radically transform um, while it's still remaining continuous. Now here the load is not continuous, but the shear will be continuous. Okay, so and well, that aside, the key takeaway here is that as long as there are no point loads, uh, as note, there are no point loads or reactions. Uh, between zones, as long as there are no point loads between zones, then the shear will be continuous. Or, expressed mathematically, I could say that my boundary condition here is that V2, or uh, sorry, V1 at x equals 6 is going to be equal to V2 at x equals 6 here. So in other words, think about this. If the shear is going to be continuous, whatever shear value, I already have the shear value for this region here. Whatever shear value I get at x equals 6 for this region here should be the exact same value I get for the shear function in this region. So if I want a boundary condition, all I have to do is substitute 6 into this expression and set it equal to this. It's really that simple. And I can calculate a known value. Uh, I can actually calculate a boundary condition. The end condition of one region becomes the end condition or boundary condition of another. So the boundary condition of one will produce the boundary condition for the next. Basically, we are ensuring that we have a compatible shear all the way across our beam. Okay, so uh, V2 is at x equals 6 here. Uh, and then uh, we can say, I, again, all I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute 6 feet into this expression here. So 1 quarter times 6 squared minus 3 times 6 plus 18.222. And when you do that, you will find that uh, this comes to uh, that this comes to 9.222 kips. So you know that V2 at x equals 6 is 9.222 kips, and this will become our boundary condition on the next slide. So I can then substitute this in and say uh, here, if I put in 9.222, again, my shear function previously, I'll, I'll, I'll have in the same thing here, where I know that V2 of x is equal to negative 2x plus C2. So if I put in um, 9.222, which is what I got here, just the n value of the first uh, of v1 of x. If I put this one uh, as v2 and set and also with an x value of six, and then plus c2, 
I can find that a constant C2 will be equal to, uh, let's see, that's going to be uh, 21.222. So our v2 as a function of x, our final v2, or a shear function in region 2, is going to be negative 2x plus 21.222 kips. 21.222 kips. Uh, next, I want to get v3. Uh, v3 of x. And I know that this is also equal, just as, it ha as we've done before, uh, equal to the integral of negative w3 of x dx. And uh, this one's going to be <laughs> very trivial, because uh, I know that uh, our w3 is just 0, so the negative integral of 0 dx, um, or the integral of negative 0 if you prefer, but negative 0 is such an interesting concept. But anyway, um, this is just going to come to a single constant, I'm going to call this c3. So we are going to have some shear in region 3, but it's going to be a constant value. But we don't know that yet. But we can get it through the exact same process we used from, uh, to go from uh, region 1 to region 2. There are no point loads between region 2 and 3, so the shear should be continuous. The shear should be continuous. And so I know that the shear uh, from the left should equal the shear from the right. So all I have to do is, so all I have to do is take this shear function here, plug in x equals 10, and I should, and then I can use that as a boundary condition for the next region. Or express mathematically, I can say that the boundary condition, uh, I could say that v3 at x uh, equals uh, 10 will also equal v2 at x equal 10. And I already have the v2 function here. So that's just going to be equal to negative 2 times 10 plus 21.222. And that's going to equal 1.222 kips. Uh, 1.222 kips. And therefore, uh, since v3 of x is just equal to a constant uh, here, uh, let's see, so I know v3 of x at that point uh, again, v3 at x equals 10 is equal to 1.22 kips. So if I substitute into this expression, well, I, it's hard to substitute in when I don't really have an x in that expression, but it's fairly obvious that c3 um, is going to be equal to uh, 1.222 kips. And so therefore, uh, v3 of x, v3 as a function of x, is just 1.222 kips. One point two 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 kips, and finally I can get v four, and the, this is going to be similar except with a slight variation. Uh, this is inter the e this is equal to the integral of negative w four of x uh, dx, and that's going to come to a different constant. It's going to it's going it's going to be the integral of zero dx. So I'm gonna, just going to go ahead and call this uh, c four constant four. This is equal to C4. Now, the tricky part about this one is the boundary condition. So, remember how I've repeatedly said that because there were, in the, in the two previous uh, regions, I repeatedly said that um, because there was no point load between the regions, the shear is continuous. However, there's a reason I included this point load in the problem, because I really wanted to be able to demonstrate how to handle something like this. This is a point load, which means I am going to have some sort of discontinuity uh, in my shear function. And if we're familiar with uh, shear functions, we know that if I have a point load somewhere in a, uh, on a beam, uh, the load uh, or the uh, shear here is going to go something like this. So if you have a shear function like that, it's going to cause it to drop down uh, by a value of whatever this is. So. Um, I can't directly say the shear in this region, uh, at the end of this region, is equal to the shear at the end of this region, but I can say that they are related, so that the difference between them is whatever this, whatever drop this causes. So, in other words, expressed mathematically, I can say that my boundary condition, I know that I have a 20 kip point load between the regions. So, what that means is, I know the shear, 
I know that the shear, uh, the end val, the end shear in region uh, three is going to be 20 kips higher than the uh, beginning shear in region four. So even though it's not continuous, I, and even though I have a point load, I can still use it as a boundary condition, just adjusting it by what I know it must be dropping by. So boundary condition, uh, V3 at x equals 14, that's the x value of the boundary between uh, zone three and zone four, uh, minus 20 is going to be equal to V4 at x equals 14. So uh, let's see, uh, V3 at x equals 14, well, this is the same as everywhere in zone three, that's just 1.222. So 1.222 minus 20 is equal to V4 at x equals 14, or this is equal to negative 18.778 equals V4. Uh, let's see, I should need to close that, x equals 14 v4 at x equals 14. And if I know this value, in other words, if I substitute, if v3 of x, or sorry, v4 of x is just equal to c4, if I put in 14 for x, well, there is no x, and negative 18.777 or 778 in for v4, I can see that c4 is clearly equal to negative 18.778. Or in other words, I can see that V4 of X is simply a constant value of negative 18.778 kips. And this is another one of those cases where, remember how I said I want to go back and repeatedly check uh, to make sure I'm on the right path? And this is one of those cases I can do that because if we go back here, uh, remember how we said a reaction on the right end of the beam will cause this thing to jump back up to zero? Well, we, we see that at the end of this beam, uh, in the last region, it has a shear of negative 18.778. And what that means is, whatever the reaction at the end of the beam, uh, under the right beam, if an upward reaction at the right end of the beam should bring this thing back to zero. And what do we have? Well, we have a reaction at B of 18.778. So that means we're going to be basically down somewhere down here then the end reaction is going to cause this thing to pop back up to zero. So we didn't need to do any math to check that, but we do have a good check showing that we have the correct uh, shear functions. Well, maybe I should, I should maybe uh, couch that. Maybe there is some weird mathematical way that, you know, this check would still come out correct and you would end up with the wrong shear function. Maybe somehow it, the error canceled itself out, but the odds of that happening are, are fairly rare. So you could go and check their old numbers again, but usually that's a pretty good sign that you got the right shear and uh, uh, with the right shear functions. Okay, so in summary, to summarize, I'm going to create my uh, combined uh, shear as a function of x expression, and so v as a function of x, my combined piecewise function with v of x being in kips. Uh, v of x, and let's go ahead and put some nice big brackets here, will be one quarter uh, x squared, one quarter x squared, minus 3x, plus 18.222, and this again is from when x is between 0 and 6. Then negative 2x, plus 21.222 when x is between 6 and 10. Then 1.222 when x is between uh, 10 and 14. And negative 18.778 when x is between uh, 14 and 18. So this is our final piecewise function. Uh, for our uh, shear going across the beam. So, uh, and that should produce all of the required values. We have the right uh, beginning values, the right end values, and all of our shear is compatible um, at each uh, intersection. Then our fourth and final step is going to be to find the moment function. So step four, uh, develop the moment function.
right, so let's see here. Now this is gonna be very similar to the previous case, um, so really not too bad, uh, except just another round of integration. So we know that m as a function of x is equal to the integral of the shear of x dx, and we're just gonna work our way down the line. So m1, the first expression for the or the or the function for the first shear region, or the expre the function for uh, sorry, moment in the first region, is going to be equal to the integral of v1 of x dx. And substituting in the appropriate uh, uh, expression, we have the integral of 1 quarter x squared minus 3x plus 18.222 dx. And again, we know how to integrate polynomials, hopefully. So we get 1 12th uh, x to the third minus 3 halves uh, x squared plus 18.222x. Of course, we can't forget our plus c. Now, uh, I could do this different ways. Sometimes when I've worked through these in the past, I'll put like, I'll restart my numbers, like I'll, uh, or sometimes I'll like continue using the same uh, numbering. Like if I, if I had a c4 here, sometimes I'll use a c5. I think in this case, since so I have, I'm already using subscripts for the, uh, uh, for the individual regions, I think I'm just going to go back and keep, I'm going to call this C1. So this is maybe referring to the C1 here refers to the constant in the moment or something like that. So I'm going to restart my numbers. It's it, my uh, subscript numbers. It's your preference how you want to do that. You don't even necessarily even have to use uh, subscripts on your constants. It's whatever it's a, it, you wish to do. It's a style choice, really. But we still need to get that constant. So we need a boundary condition. And here we need to go back to our uh, beam diagram. Now this is what this one's going to be fairly simple. This is a simply supported beam, so I know that uh, because this is a simply supported beam, that the moment has to be zero on this end. Now we'll see later that it doesn't actually have to be zero on this end because I have this uh, applied uh, couple here, and we'll talk about that when we get to the end of the beam. We're going to do the same thing we did previously. Uh, or we did when we were looking at the shear, we're going to start at the left end and work our way across zone by zone. So my first boundary condition, though, is just to say that the moment at A is going to be equal to zero because I have a pin joint there. So again, the very definition of a pin joint is one that cannot resist any moment. It's, it's very, it's definitional. And so if it can't resist any moment, there can't be any moment inside the beam at that point, because if there would, there'd be nothing to resist it. So uh, the moment at A has to equal zero. So here, uh, let's see here. I have a very simple boundary condition. Uh, M1, my boundary condition is going to be that M1 at x equals zero is equal to zero. And therefore, I thought this one's very simple. I don't even need to work through a lot of algebra. If I substitute zero into all of these and set this equal to zero, I can very easily see that C1 is equal to zero. And therefore, M1 as a function of x is equal to 1 12th x to the third minus 3 halves x squared plus 18.222x. And I'm going to keep in mind that uh, I've simplified a bit in rounding here. Uh, these are repeating decimals, and a couple of things later in the problem, it'll actually uh, come to even numbers. And so I'm going to go ahead and write those as even numbers when they come to even numbers. But uh, again, I could leave that as a decimal. It's our choice. I could leave this a decimal or a fraction. It's a style choice. If you're, uh, if you're designing a beam uh, and sizing a beam uh, precise enough that that small decimal is going to matter, um, well, your margin of safety is way too small. You're going to kill someone. So let's not worry about such things. Okay. So there's your m1 as a function of x. And now I'm going to get m2 as a function of x. And that, of course, is equal to the shear 2 as a function of x dx. And uh, let's see. So we need to take our uh, shear function and substitute that in. And we have the shear function in region 2 is going to be equal to what? Well, that's going to be equal to the integral of negative 2x plus uh, 21 uh, 0.2222, uh, 0.222 dx. And therefore, uh, this comes to, uh, if I run through the integral, this is negative x squared plus 21.222x 
uh, plus a constant 2, C2. Now, I need a boundary condition. And looking at zone 2, yet again, I don't have any, uh, yet again, I don't have any, um, any point moment there. So I know the moment is going to be continuous from this zone going into this zone, going into this zone. So I know that I can just use the end moment from this region to be the start moment for this region. So the, mo the moment, uh, the, one, the one moment region becomes the boundary condition for the next moment region. All right, so, or expressed mathematically, I can say that the boundary condition uh, can be that m at x equal, or actually I should say m1 at x equals six is going to be equal to m2 at x equals six. And we can get that by just plugging in six into this expression, which will equal 1 12th, uh, 1 12th times six to the third power minus 3 halves times 6 squared plus 18.222 times 6. And if you multiply all that out in the calculator, you will find that m2 at x equals 6 must equal 73.333 feet, or sorry, kip feet. Feet would be an interesting unit for a moment. 73.333 kip feet. Now this isn't the same thing as the actual moment function. So I'm gonna go, and I need to then find the actual constant. So let's see here, I need to find the actual constant. Substituting that in. I need to substitute uh, six feet into uh, this expression and set it equal to 73.333. So uh, here, uh, 73, 0.333 is equal to negative 6 squared plus 21.222 times 6 plus C2. And then if you solve that, you will find that C2 is equal to negative 18, which means M2 as a function of x is equal to negative x squared uh, equal to negative x squared plus 21.222x minus 18. All right, so we have the moment in the second region, and now I wish to find the moment in the third region. So I know for m3 that m3 as a function of x is going to be the integral uh, of v of, uh, v of x dx, or in particular, the integral of v3 of x dx. So this is going to be equal to the integral in the third region of the shear. So equal to the third region integral, or third shear region integral uh, here. So we're going to do the same thing we did previously just working through our, our integration of the third uh, shear region, applying appropriate boundary conditions. So let's do that. And if we substitute in our uh, shear function, the shear function here is relatively straightforward. It's going to be the integral of, well, the shear function was a constant value of 1.222 uh, dx, and then of course integrating with respect to x, and we get a function then of 1.222x plus a constant, and I'll just call this C3, plus C3. Now, I need a boundary condition, and going back to our diagram here, our load diagram, I see that between two and three, I'm definitely not gonna have any kind of discontinuity in the moment. Uh, there'll be discontinuity in the load, but there's not gonna be any discontinuity in the shear or any discontinuity in the moment function. So I can do the same thing I did previously, uh, simply saying that the boundary condition or simply saying the boundary condition is as follows. Boundary condition. Uh, here, maybe I'll underline that as well for consistency. The M, uh, M um, perhaps M3 at X equals uh, 10, that's the boundary between the second and third region, is going to be equal to M2 at X equals 10. So all I need to do is take this function and substitute in 10. And so it's going to be negative 10 squared plus 21.222 times 10 minus 18. And this comes to a value of 94.222. Uh, kip feet, of course. 
So I now know that at x equals 10, uh, basically I now have a, a boundary condition that at x equals 10, the moment in region 3 is equal to 94.2 kip feet. So that's a point of known moment. I can then use this to find my uh, C3 value. So 94.222 equals 1.222 uh, times 10 plus C3 and sub multiplying and subtracting, we will get that C3 is equal to actually precisely 82 kip feet. This is one of those things where the uh, ex the uh, repeating decimal cancels out and we're left with exactly 82 kip feet if you carry through a large number of decimal places. And then, or I did it in fractional form as well. And then finally, M3 of X uh, is gonna be equal to uh, simply, if I put this in the combined form uh, or in its final form, 1.22X plus 82. Then um, I want to get m4 and it's going to be the same process. m4 at x is equal to, uh, let's see, the integral of uh, v4 of x and then substituting in the v4, uh, well of course dx, substituting in the v4 expression, uh, the shear in region 4 was equal to negative 18.778 or 777 repeating or 7 repeating dx, and that comes to negative 18, the integral there comes to negative 18.778 x plus c4. Again, just giving it a constant and, and a subscript 4. Now, boundary condition. I do need a boundary condition here. And I can use, this is a boundary condition. I can use the boundary condition uh, between zones 3 and 4, knowing that, uh, now, this is a dis this point load represents a discontinuity in the shear function. Uh, it is only a point load, it's not a point moment, so it's not going to produce a discontinuity in the moment function. If I had a, cu uh, a couple here, that would represent a discontinuity in the moment function, but this is only a point load on a point moment, so my, sh my moment function will actually be continuous here. So my boundary condition can be very simply said as the moment, uh, let's say, 3, at x equals 14, that's the, of course the x-coordinate of the uh, transition, uh, it, between 3 and 4 is equal to m4 at x equals 14 as well. So all I need to do is plug in um, 14 into my previous m3 expression. And that's going to equal 1.222 times 14 uh, plus 82, my previous, uh, the, pr at the end of that previous function, and that comes to 99.111 uh, kip feet. Then substituting in 14 and 19.991 into here, I can get the 99.1 repeating uh, is equal to negative 18.778 x plus c4. Uh, plus c4 here, and I get, if you solve for that, oh actually I should say uh, times uh, 14, sorry, plus c4 and solving for C4, I get that C4 is exactly equal to 362 uh, kip feet. And underline that, and that produces a expression, M4 at X equal to negative 18.778 X plus 362. Now, I do want to do one final check. So let's do a check here. We have 18.778. Let's see what happens if we get we put in our final 18 feet value at the length. Negative, what is M4 of 18? Let's see if we got this right. Negative 18.77 repeating uh, times 18 plus 362. What do we get? Let's turn it into a calculator. I have one right here. Let's give that a try. And we get, what do you know, 24 uh, kip feet. And, uh, interestingly enough, uh, now you might think, wait a minute, why would this be a, uh, w just like with the, with the end reaction, we expect to end up with a, uh, a negative value and then the reaction brings it back positive. You can sometimes get caught full, uh, thinking in circles with the clockwise versus counterclockwise, literally thinking in circles. But what's going to happen here, uh, if you remember uh, from statics, a point moment if it is a clockwise, if it's a positive point moment, it's going to cause a decrease in the moment, in the internal moment, because there's not a negative on that uh, on the shear to moment integral. Or another way to think of this is if you apply a 
positive moment to be outside of the beam, the internal moment must uh, decrease. Or if you, if you apply a negative moment to the outside of the beam, the internal moment must increase. So in other words, here, the final end value of this function, uh, the final end value of this function is 24 kip feet. So if, I had, if we put it, if we had an, our m of x graph, the, if this was the zero line, the final value would be something like this. Uh, I guess we could actually make it uh, the appropriate function would be a linear function with a negative slopes or something like that would come in, and we'd end up with 24 here. But then uh, we'd have that point moment, and that point moment itself is positive, which means because the applied moment is positive, the internal moment is going to become more negative or decrease, and we'll end up right back at zero, which is what we would expect for a roller support. So this does check out. We are good. So in summary, um, we, again, this is a final check you can do. Um, if we didn't have the end moment, uh, we would just know that uh, we would, should get it. We should have gotten a final. Uh, sorry, if we didn't have the end moment, we would put in 18, and we would get zero at the end if we did it right. And if we did have a point moment somewhere along the way, like a, let's say we had a point moment uh, at, let's say at the transition zone here, in addition to the point load, we had a point moment or a couple. Uh, that would cause if, if I had this exact same uh, positive 24 kit feet. I would know that the, sh that the moment between this zone and this zone should decrease by 24 because, again, you apply the opposite to the, sh to the moment diagram. Now, finally, let's summarize. Uh, my final moment function is going to be a piecewise function as follows, like this, uh, 1 twelfth x to the third minus 3 halves x squared plus 18.222 x, and this is when x is between 6 and 0. And then negative x squared uh, plus 21.222x minus 18, and this is when x is between 6 and 10. Then 1.222x plus 82, uh, when x is between 10 and 14 the third zone. And finally, our negative 18.778 uh, x plus 362 when x is between uh, 14 and 18 foot at the last region of 14 and 18, not 18 and 14, in the last region of our beam. They can box that because that would be our final answer. Now, if we wanted to, we could easily plot these shear and minimum moment functions. I chose not to do that at this point. I just wanted to work, I, I wanted to produce this video to work through the uh, long form integration long and show the, uh, not really long form integration, more long form problem showing the various integration zones and also how you use the boundary conditions and transform them, uh, transfer them one region into the next. All right, that'll do it for today. Thank you for watching. And as always, thank you.